This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak to lexicographer Erin McKean. She talks to me about coding haikus, allo grooming and etymology, the process of giving a great TED talk, and speaking in front of Bill Clinton. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have Erin McKean. Erin is a lexicographer and founder of WordNick.com, the world's biggest online dictionary. Before founding WordNick, she was the editor-in-chief of American Dictionaries for Oxford University Press. Her goal is to make every word in the English language look upable, including the 52% of unique English words aren't currently in any dictionary. She is also the author of three books herself, including her most recent, The Hundred Dresses, a field guide to dresses. She's been a columnist for the Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, and New York Times. It's my great pleasure to have her on the show. Welcome to the show, Erin. Thank you so much. So share with our listeners, what's going on in your world just now? Oh, a a lot of JavaScript, oddly enough. Uh, I think that oftentimes people think if you work with words today, you're mostly just writing prose, but a lot of it is building tools to share words more widely online. And you're a serious coder. I mean, you're a full stack um, uh, coder <laughs> as well, aren't you? That's kind of a joke because uh, now now that WordNick's a, a nonprofit, I'm kind of a full stack coder by default. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I do really enjoy coding. I think that people who love language often are surprised by how much they love coding, but really JavaScript's just another language. So, so what is it that links then this the the love of words and the love of coding? Is there, is there, a, is there a, something that's, that links these things? I think it's the underlying idea that words do things, right? Mm. I can I can make you have a reaction by using certain words to you or at you. And with uh, with computer programming languages, it's much more direct. If you do it correctly, it's like Harry Potter magic, right? You say some words, and something happens in the real word world. And, and you hear with, you know, when coders are talking to each other, they, they're often talking about um, the elegance of, of, of a piece of code and how few, it's almost like poetry, you know, how few lines of code it takes to get something done. It's like stripping it back. Yes, I think there's a lot of overlap between um, poetry and coding. And I actually do know some coders who do computer generated poetry. But I actually think that that the kind of code that I like is like really clear journalism, right? The goal is to make sure that, that the person receiving that text understands it because the computer is going to understand it or it's going to throw an error. But what you really care about is the next person who's going to have to interact with that code and whether they think it's clear, especially because 99% of the time that person is going to be you in six months and you don't want to be cursing your past self for being too clever. So can you, when, when you get code from someone else and I'm not, I'm not a coder, I've worked in technology companies, but I'm not a coder. Can, can you almost, um, when you're reading their codes, they, they have a, a strong imprint of their style. So for example, this person's very Hemingway esque, <laughs> very short, like to the point, very action orientated. This person's more like Emily Bronte. They, they take a lot of a lot of code to say, you know, a small number of things. I think it depends on what the code is doing because there are some like genres of code where it's very straightforward. Like I don't think that people's literary style comes across very well when they're like telling you how to make chocolate chip cookies or giving you directions to a restaurant. Like that's very transactional in nature, but I think the more interesting the job that the code is doing, the more scope there is for uh, kind of conveying your individual mode of thinking. And where did you first get this fascination for words and, and their meaning? I have actually wanted to work on dictionaries since I was eight years old. Wow. That is, that's so can you, you remember that, that place where you had that sensation, that feeling, this is what you wanted to do. 
I actually have documentary evidence. Um, I read an article in a newspaper about the Oxford English Dictionary. And it was about how the supplement, I think it was the supplement or maybe the second edition, I'd have to actually go and look at it, was 27 years behind schedule. And I don't know what about that that story resonated with me. I remember that they were, um, you know, it was, it was kind of a human interest story. Like, oh, those wacky lexicographers, they're going to spend their whole lives working on this one thing. And I thought, that sounds great. Like, what is wrong with that? <laughs> But you mentioned in uh, in your TED talk, which uh, which we'll put a link here on on the show notes as well, um, that dictionaries haven't really changed since uh, Queen um, Queen Victoria, really. <laughs> and uh, so, so in this time, you know, f- you know, from from that point until relatively recently, what what was going on with dictionaries? Was it just they were just adding more words and more meaningful words? It, it stayed a pretty static kind of format. Yes, it's it, it's kind of like you can think of dictionaries as like a literary form. And they they were remarkably consistent for hundreds of years. Now, of course, that TED Talk was a very long time ago. So stuff has been changing, which I think is great, and I'm all for it. But I think that the the reason the dictionaries were fairly static is that, first of all, it worked, right? You know? was the right format for the right need at the right time. And it was only when we started to have more flexibility in how we could present this kind of specialized technical information to people that we could think about, oh, okay, well, what else is possible? I think that it's often difficult for people to to separate the idea of the dictionary as kind of a literary monument from the idea of a dictionary as a tool whose job it is to help you get things done. But I suppose a dictionary is a, is a constantly evolving thing. I had a guest on earlier. We were talking about um, where fiction publishing was going, and, and we were talking about the analogy of within uh, software, where you'll have version 1.0, then you know a couple of months later, a couple of weeks later, they'll upgrade it, and version 2.0, and we were having a conversation, are, are we going to have people with like, antiquarian kindles where you go into a shop it's like old kindles with first editions it's never been upgraded it actually has the has that very first first edition on it so when when it comes to what you were trying to do with wordnik so things dictionaries are always changing all the time what problem were you trying to solve with wordnik well when i was working on more traditional dictionaries i you know part of the fun of that is answering people's questions about words And one of the questions that I got all the time was, why isn't word X in the dictionary? And the answer people wanted was because it's not good enough, right? They were like, they were either going to argue the merits of the word they wanted included, or they wanted reassurance that a word that they particularly disliked was never going to make the cut. And that's not the answer. Like the answer is usually because a print dictionary has limited space and time. And an online dictionary, although the space is, is notionally infinite, still has the problem of limited time of the lexicographers. So the decisions are made about inclusion or exclusion based on, do we have time to treat this word in the, in the way that it needs to be treated in order to explain it to someone else? And how many people do we think are going to need this word? So it's very pragmatic. Like, it doesn't matter whether the word is ugly or beautiful, you know, offensive or considerate. None of that matters. What matters is, are people going to need it? But the problem is, you're kind of aiming for the, the common denominator, right? The average person. But nobody is the average person. And people have all sorts of different needs. So if you're looking up a word and it's not there, what do you do? do you wait? You know, most dictionaries add, you know, a couple thousand words a year and there are lots and lots of words out there that aren't in dictionaries. And so that was kind of the problem I was trying to solve. Like how can we get information about words to people who want it as quickly as possible without having to write definitions? And obviously, we have things like uh, with Jimmy Wales with Wikipedia and um, and kind of out the crowdsourcing of 
of uh, of content as well. Um, is that part of what you do at WordNix? You have you know official kind of lexicographers, but then you also have this kind of online community of people that are kind of helping sorting and sifting things. Actually, nobody does any editorial work. So what we try to do is, um, so everybody, I think, understands the Wikipedia model. There's a thing in the world and you want to describe it and you write about it. And it's very important that people be unbiased and that uh, the, the references are sourced and that it has a neutral point of view. And there are all these Wikipedia rules to try to make really good uh, encyclopedia entries. And there's Wiktionary where people write traditional dictionary definitions in the same kind of crowdsourced way. But it turns out that there are a lot of really effective, useful definitions that are being written by people every day who have no interest and no desire and no kind of um, impetus to write dictionary definitions because mostly they're journalists. So if you're a journalist and you're trying to explain a new topic to your audience, you often have to use new words and new jargon, slang terms, whatever, what have you. And you have to make sure that they're clear. So you write a sentence um, that explains that word to your audience and you just move on. And those sentences are findable. You can use uh, data mining and machine learning techniques to say, here's what a uh, we call them free range definitions because they're like out there in the world living their lives and then we go find them. Um, these sentences, these free range definitions are findable. And I can actually uh, like tell you a couple that I found in the last few days. Um, so a transect. Now a transect is actually a word that is in a lot of dictionaries, but it's kind of a technical term. And a transect is a cut or path through part of the environment showing a range of different habitats. Uh, So let's say that you decided to walk um, in a straight line between you and the nearest city, and you just checked at every, you know, set distance, what's the habitat like at this place? What plants do you find? What animals do you find? And that would be a transect. And uh, there's a grooming, aloe grooming, the grooming of another individual called aloe grooming aloe has grooming. both hy- yeah has both hygienic and signal functions in many birds and mammals. So that's like when you see um, like chimpanzees like grooming exactly. each other. Exactly. Aloe grooming. And, and uh, oh, this one's a fun one. Get festive with your hot dog by sticking it in a tortilla with guacamole, salsa, sour cream, and cheese for a hako. Okay, that's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like so and all of these things came from uh journalism. I think I maybe actually the aloe grooming uh came from maybe a Wikipedia page. Um oh, and then when you're oh, no. yeah. when you're you're obviously discovering these these new words that are out there as well. Um, you're, you're adding a definition, you're giving uh, maybe links and another kind of maybe supporting evidence, images and other things that, that are on there. Um, how do you even begin to go around looking at, f- trying to find the origins? Uh, 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 I'm, I'm, now, the word I'm probably going to get wrong, you'll be able to tell me, is the epistemology? Is that like the, the, where the, ori- <laughs> the, uh, the origin no, not, of things? No, not quite. What, what, is, what, what's the ter- what is that word? Uh, it's etymology. Etymology, and that's the word I'm Actually, like. you have hit on the right thing because, so we don't actually write definitions. We'll pick them up from sources that we have uh, license agreements to show the definitions. But we think that these sentences often stand in for definitions because most of the words you learned in your life, you never look them up in a dictionary. You read them in a book or a magazine or heard someone use them. Uh, And that was enough to add the word to your working vocabulary. But etymology, etymology is a very, I would say, difficult. And it's not really a science as much as it is an art. And it takes an enormous amount, I think, of education and just, uh, you know, sprockful, you know, feeling for language to be a good etymologist. And that is the place where I think that traditional dictionaries, especially the OED, which is, you know, kind of the world leader in this, um, they shine because that's the kind of thing that takes real human work. There's a wonderful 
a wonderful scholar at the University of Minnesota named Anatoly Lieberman. And if you want to lose an afternoon, go read his blog posts about etymology. And he has a wonderful book about etymology that kind of explains it for lay people. I think it's called uh, Word Histories and How We Know Them, maybe. Um, and he is just the most charming person that you would ever want to read. And he probably knows every single uh, old language that ever talked to English for 10 minutes. Do you ever, when you, you're going through uh, these words and, and you're discovering these and you're kind of mining these these words as well, do you ever feel a little bit peeved about how small the average word count is when we read most newspapers or online magazines or, uh, or you hear people talking on TV you know, it makes me that, you know, they, they say the Eskimos have about 20 different words for the word snow. Um, and does it, you know, when you li- read things or you, you, you listen to things or listen to things on, on radio, does it kind of, you know, annoy you a little bit about how small people's words are because of how small their, their language is? Um, well, so the Eskimo thing is a bit of a myth. Really? Um, ah, okay. Yes. So it turns out, like, You know, the English language, uh, we tend to separate our words out in a way that certain other languages, including the Inuit languages, don't. So those languages are agglutinating languages, which means instead of saying, you know, in English, we would say wet snow, and we would consider those two different words. In an agglutinating, sorry, in an agglutinating language, you would kind of add a particle that means wet to a root that means snow. And so to an English language speaker, it would look like, one word, mm. but it's really kind of two ideas glommed together. And since there's not a space, we think of it as one word. I see. So, but so, on, on that point, but I think though, about, <laughs> about feeling, you know, you're spending all day surrounded by words <laughs> and, and ideas, you know, then you'll switch on, you know, the, the evening news and they're using a pool of maybe, you know, 1500 words. <laughs> is, you know, is, is the, oh, I've never so, done a count. Um, So, I guess I love words, and I think that uh, people should use more of them. Like, I think there are a lot of words that are underloved, but uh, it's kind of like you really want the right word at the right time for the right need. Mm. And if you're if you're trying to communicate, you know news about a protest or what's going on in Syria or Brexit, you might not want a really unusual word to distract from your goal, which is to communicate as clearly as possible facts. But but sometimes using those unusual words can um, almost act like a pattern interrupt with people because they they get taken aback. Like, they know, they think (laughs) they're going to hear a certain word. I mean, I think about something like... uh, a German, uh, I think it's a German word, uh, a Stürsucker, I think it means like vacuum cleaner or Hoover. <laughs> and I think Stürsucker, that sounds much better <laughs> than the vacuum cleaner um, because it, it kind of has this kind of onomatopoeic, it has a, you know, you kind of know like, a sense of what it is as well. So do you ever find yourself using kind of unusual words, you know, just simply to have fun and just kind of play and kind of knock people out of their, their usual way of thinking? Oh, now I think that is an excellent point. And yes, I like to do that a lot. And sometimes people complain. They're like, oh, they think it's snobbish or rude to use, you know, what, 50 cent words. But the thing is, is that when the idea that big words were kind of a luxury good started, they actually were. Print dictionaries were really expensive. The average working person in Samuel Johnson's time could have no more bought his dictionary than they could have gone to the moon. So being able to look up a word was actually an elite thing. But now everybody's got a supercomputer in their pocket and it's 30 seconds to type in a word and get an answer back that will give you a rough idea of what it means. So, you, you, I mentioned as well you're, you're now an author in your own right with three books. What was holding you back from your 
writing that very first book? Because you're, you're obviously surrounded by by words, by you're reading all the time as well. What was holding you back from getting that first one published? Oh, um, well, when I when I was working at Oxford, I in addition to uh, working on the dictionary program, I was also an acquiring editor. So I would um, choose books that I thought Oxford should publish about language. Like a, one of my favorite books that Oxford published when I was there was a book about the slang of the television show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Which is exactly what people think of when they think of Oxford University Press, of course. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful book. And, and uh, so I kind of knew how much work it was from the inside. Mm. Like not just... Uh, not just the work of actually writing the book, which is a lot, but also the work of finding the publisher and making sure the marketing works and, you know, dealing with all of the, the apparatus of publishing. But, um, and uh, I've done a couple of books at Oxford where, where I was like the notional author, like books of weird words and and that was that kind of felt like oh this is my day job like i make word books and here's another word book um but the first book that i published uh that wasn't kind of word oriented was a novel and that was that was completely different it was one of those things it's it's like uh it's like what everybody tells you before having a baby you think that you've got it under control like <laughs> you you've read everything you know what it's going to be like and then you have a baby and you think what happened how could i have been so wrong um but luckily just like having a baby there uh writing a novel is terrible having written a novel is fantastic so that process as well of um the so you've you've written that first draft or the first few drafts and then you're giving it to an editor in order to get uh, feedback and then you know proofreaders and 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 all that stuff. How long in that that very first book out of interest did it take you from the initial inception of this is the kind of book I want to write to it kind of hitting the hitting the shelves? Oh, it was a long time. It was probably a couple of years. I was also founding a startup at the same time, so it's all kind of a blur. So where were you finding uh, where were you finding time? Because this is something I hear, you know, people who, who they ha- they they want to write, but then they say, "Well, I've got this day job, I've got this day gig, and I've got family and things." So it sounds like you had a lot of other things kind of going on as well. Where did you kind of find the time to write? I I did that thing that everybody tells you to do, which is you wake up in the morning and you write first thing. And I did all the revisions at my long suffering in law's house over the Christmas holidays. <laughs> And um, uh, they must have loved you for uh, that. <laughs> I really did just kind of emerge to eat Christmas cookies, wish everyone a happy holiday, and then went back <laughs> to the proof pages. Uh, funnily enough, the part that was the most difficult for me was kind of um, uh, I, I felt that because of my day job, that any language errors or things that could be considered language errors in the book would be uh would be subjected to greater scrutiny which is ridiculous it's a chiclet novel about dresses and um but i was i had a very like detailed email to the poor suffering copy editor about which dictionary i considered authoritative the one i worked on obviously they're they're, they're probably not getting emails like that about many chiclet books i would would imagine (laughs) Right. And like, I had very strong opinions about um, uh, capitalization of genericized trademarks. I'm against it. And um, hyphenation and and things like that. So I hope she got hazard pay. So obviously that that book was a, a, a you know success, you, and then you went on to write other. You've gone on to write other books as well. But can you tell me about a time in, um, in your life where you worked on a project, you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason it just didn't work out like you'd hoped? And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that experience? Oh, I am a very pig-headed and stubborn person, so I think it takes me longer to learn lessons. Um, than it might take other people. Um, 
I, uh, I had been working on a, uh, a project that had been, um, Oh, actually, it's something with Wordnik that makes it that I think a lot. Like, so Wordnik has a word of the day list, and we send out a word of the day, you know, every day, and we choose words specifically that are kind of for entertainment purposes only. Like, they are not very useful words. They're funny, they're old fashioned, they're interesting, but they're not stuff that you're going to add to your daily vocabulary. And I thought, well, wouldn't everybody like to have their own word of the day list that they could send out to their friends? And we built it and crickets. Like, I don't know, maybe a dozen people decided to make their own words of the day list to email to all their friends. And, you know, it was kind of classic software engineering, you know, mistake, right? The first thing you should do is figure out if anybody wants the thing and then you should build it. But we were like so convinced, full speed ahead, that, you know, this is going to be the next, you know, pet rock and Pokemon mixed together. And nobody, nobody wanted it at all. And then when we ended up uh, moving the site to a a new um, platform, we silently turned off the feature I think two people said, hey, what's up with that? And everybody else just shrugged. That's right. I, I sometimes do that with, with features or things that, that we'll do here where, you know, maybe the people get used to getting it every week and then I'll, I'll switch it off for a week and I won't do it for a week. <laughs> and, I, and I want to see how many people complain bitterly about it. And if people, a lot of people complain bitterly, I know I should probably put it back on. If not a lot of people complain bitterly about it, then actually, is it really worth doing um, as well? So the, the lesson that you took away from that experience, what was it to to have a build a, uh, you know, a min- more minimum viable product with something or to really test your assumptions that people want this thing? I think testing assumptions is absolutely what you have to do. And you can't just test it once with a couple of uh, kindred spirits that you know very well. It, you have to figure out, okay, well, how how many people would actually be the audience for this thing? And what percentage of those people show any interest at all? And is that enough to make it worthwhile? Because... If you build it, they will come it is a movie fantasy. It is not the real world. And then what, so you've, uh, but you do actually have a, a word of the day as well, where people can sign up for the email, which I really, you know, like the idea of people put their email um, address in and they get sent a new word as well. Um, when it comes to social media, I, I was reading a study the other day about Facebook, uh, how, what a lot of people share on Facebook are things that make them seem maybe smart. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I wondered whether, and obviously quote cards are huge on Facebook. I, you know, I wonder, I'm not sure if there's something that you do already or whether someone else does this already where you can take those words and rather than being in an email form, you know, just within a couple of seconds, just create a quote card for it, you know, put it up on Facebook and see, see the, what, you know, how, how shareable it is. Oh, we, we do that in kind of a limited way. Um, we use MailChimp as our email provider yep. and they're really great and they make it very easy to automatically send out your same email campaign to Facebook and Twitter. Um, who knows? They might even have Instagram at this point. <laughs> um, and I have to say though, that with WordNick, we probably have not leveraged social media as much as we can. We spend a lot of time and effort on Twitter, mostly because we like it. Um, and also because uh, Twitter for good or ill doesn't seem to change up how things work as often as Facebook does. So it's a little easier to manage. And something as, as I'm hearing you speaking as well, because you, you, you're, you're very obviously really passionate about words. Have you ever thought about actually launching a podcast, you know, a podcast about words and the um where words come from and the meaning of words because something i'm always interested in when people uh, you know our listeners come to us is podcast listeners seem to be readers in a big way 
um, I, I, I've got no stats to back this up yet, but just uh, just speaking to a lot of our, our listeners, that they're big consumers of of Kindle books and big you know big consumers of, of Audible um, uh, you know uh, audio books as well. Have you ever thought about, it, or is there? There may all be ready a podcast related to kind of words. Oh, uh, the Illusionist with an A. Ah, okay. Is I think probably one of the best, if not the best, languagey podcasts out there. Um, I would love to do a podcast at some point, but my to-do list, nothing ever seems to come off of it. Things just keep getting added on to the end. And and uh, we'll put the link, obviously, to your TED Talk, which you did a, a while ago. Um, but that, you know, to, to deliver a talk like that requires a lot of work, I would imagine. Um, so how did you go about developing that talk um, and kind of, you know, practicing it and getting it so um, uh, so perfectly, you know, kind of organized um, and presented? I feel like I was extremely lucky because this, the so that's, that talk, um, if, uh, the, the one about dictionaries was in 2007. And then I did one for Ted Youth, I guess, in 2014. But the, the 2007 talk, um, I was asked to do Ted in, I guess, 2006, which is before Ted really became the juggernaut, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in fact, when I met Chris Anderson, I didn't even know what Ted was. And I was momentarily confused because the editor of Wired Magazine at the time was also named Chris Anderson. And um, it wasn't the one I was expecting. So, um, so I, you know, I'm a dictionary editor. I will happily go and talk about words to whoever will have me. And so I was like, sure, I'd be happy to talk. This is so great. Thank you so much for asking me. And then I found out what Ted actually was. And I had like a minor freak out. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I was like, okay, you're telling me that, all right, I, I have to give this talk and it has to be 18 minutes long. And, oh, and by the way, Bill Clinton's going to be there. Sure. And, <laughs> but Chris Anderson is lovely. And he... We had a couple of long phone calls where he gave me great feedback. I um, watched some of the talks that they had just put online right before that conference. It's it's the 10th anniversary of TED actually putting their talks online. So there were just a few online at the time. Um, and uh, I just practiced. I practiced until not only was I sick of the sound of my own voice, I was sick of words. <laughs> it was, yeah. I, I never thought that that could happen. Um, and of course there's also like a lot of stress about what are you going to wear and things like that. Um, uh, my son actually helped me. Uh, I do a lot of sewing, so I make most of my clothes and I was trying to figure out what colors to use. And he, he actually picked the colors for the fabric that I ended up making that dress out of. And it's great because I seem to remember because the Ted color is that red, <clears throat> quite a strong red, which you, I think you had like a piping on the on the dress or something with with that kind of red color. And obviously, you know about dresses. You know, <laughs> you've actually <laughs> written books about about this as an area. So, you know, where did the hundred dresses and where did that idea permeate from? Well, there's a very famous children's book called The Hundred Dresses, um, which is which is not really about dresses. It's really about bullying. Um, it's a, it's well worth reading. It's about a little girl who says she has a hundred dresses and, and she's actually a, a refugee. She's a pole and she's very poor. And the other girls say, you couldn't possibly have a hundred dresses. You wear the same dress to school every day. And then she, she moves away and they find that she has drawn pictures of hundreds of beautiful dresses. And of course they all feel bad for having been terrible people and bullying, but I, I realized that like we talk about dresses as if they're all the same thing, but there are so many different kinds of dresses and there's a semiotics. There's a meaning behind dresses. Like if you show up someplace in a flapper dress, that's way different. That has a different feel. You're communicating different things than if you show up in like a fifties housewife dress, or if you're like Lady Gaga and you show up in a dress made out of meat. 
See, men's, so, clothing, men's clothing is so much duller. <laughs> than is, I know. I feel sorry for y'all. We need to. Like, we need. We need to have a little bit of a revolution. I, 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 when uh, when David Beckham uh, started doing kind of kind of more interesting things with fashion, I thought, oh, this could this could be finally going to start breaking out of the uh, the traditional suits and uh, and and that look as well. So I think we need to have we need to have the hundred suits or the hundreds whatever for 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 men as well instead. <laughs> um, so, so uh, you know, you obviously kind of um, went in a book, and I, and I saw some great reviews um, uh, for that book as well. And people are obviously really passionate about this as a um, this as an area. Yes, I think so. I mean, it's it's interesting that it's kind of the last piece of gendered clothing. You know, I don't know, probably maybe not so much where you are, but here on the West Coast in California, I do see men in kilts, utility kilts mostly from time to time. There's a lot more fluidity in how people dress, but dresses are really for women. And I feel like, I think it would be great if more men started wearing dresses because I think dresses are awesome and everybody should have the opportunity to wear them. But it feels like that a lot of things that are traditionally feminine get short shrift. Like it's, Oh, that's just for girls. We don't have to think about it. And what's fascinating for me about dresses is there's just so much there. And us, us, us Scots, we kind of got there first. So there's, there's, there's there's, uh, there's men walking around just now quite comfortable in uh, dresses and kilts as uh, as well. So we, we were, we were kind of, we were very early adopters (laughs) to to the idea. I think that's ideal. Scots is, the Scots are, I think, uh, also at the forefront of lexicography. Really? I didn't realize that. Yeah. James Murray, who was the first real editor of the OED, was a Scot. And I think also Craigie, mm-hmm. um, Onions. Well, the, a lot of the early uh, OED lexicographers were Scots. Um, my family is originally from Scotland, but originally means like 250 years ago. I, I, um, I, I think one of the reasons, um, and I was talking to someone the other day, I was in Miami the other day, I was talking to a, to a, a podcaster who had a really interesting person on the show talking about why cities b- were became very creative, why you, you had Athens and why you have Edinburgh in, in the Enlightenment and why you yeah. have San Francisco now. What, what are the reasons behind some of those things? And there's lots of little kernels. And I think one of the reasons that Probably Scotland has this very strong tradition of of education and learning and and words. I mean, kind of there's a, there's a strong kind of bookish culture as well. Is probably because of the church. You know, the the, the Kirk here, the version of the church. Um, in order to get everyone to uh, read the Bible, had to make teach everyone how to read first, which was not necessarily the way in other countries where they wanted to keep the 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 writing um to certain number of people that could actually read and then those people would then tell everyone else what things meant rather than being able to have you know people having a direct access to 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 the words themselves so i think that's maybe one of the the kind of but there's a really fascinating book and if i can find a link i'll put this in the in the show notes as well so in this creative journey you've had can you tell us about and maybe an insight or a light bulb moment in your life where you've said okay this is a direction i need to go in the work that I'm doing or maybe a new distinction that you, that you recognized? I think one thing that has been very um, apparent to me and more so lately is that a lot of people say begin with the goal in mind, but I think you have to be very open to the idea that the path is not going to be the same. When I first started working on dictionaries, uh, I was telling somebody this the other day. We were working on paper. I actually had a big sheet of plastic that I had to put over the proof so that I could count the characters and lines that would need to be edited out and then added back in. Like a, a transparency. And, you know, things have gradually become more and more computerized. And if you, if you hold on too tight to the how you do things, you're not going to get to the what that you actually want to do. You have to be very flexible about your methods. Like 20 years ago, if you had told me, oh, Aaron, your job is going to be mostly writing JavaScript and messing around with servers, 
I would have said, you're nuts. Like, <laughs> sure, I like computers and all, but you can't tell me that, that you know, lexicography for me is going to be more about coding than it is going to be about crafting prose definitions. But my end goal is really to share as many words as possible with as many people as possible. And that's a great goal. So we've been talking about different resources and, uh, you know, talking about WordNick itself. But are there any other online resources or tools or apps like Evernote that you, you love and you enjoy using? Oh, probably way too many to list. Um, there's a wonderful blog called The Setup, I think, where people talk about what they've uh, what they use in their their daily life. And I love reading through that because that shows everybody's tools. Um, one other dictionary that I wish more people knew about is the Dictionary of American Regional English. There's actually a dictionary of the older Scottish tongue online too, which is awesome. Um, there are lots of kind of regional English dictionaries that treat words that are specific to particular places. Um, and those words are wonderful. There are like dozens of words in American English for dust bunnies. Like the, <laughs> the yeah, the, you know, the lint and fuzz and mm-hmm. dust under your bed. Yeah. And that was obviously a big, think, that, that was obviously a big thing in, uh, you know, the, the, the 1790s. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but all this stuff comes down to the present day. And, uh, the Dictionary of American Regional English is, um, it's got an online website. It's, it's paywalled, but most people's libraries should have access. And it, I think lots of people like to go to it and look up their, their home, you know, their home state or their hometown and say, oh, yes, I've always called this that. And now I know why. That's great. And I'll put, definitely put these links as well in the show notes. And if you could recommend just one book and one record, one album to our listeners, what would they be? Oh, I've been thinking about this and it's so hard. But the book, the book that I would recommend is, and I've got it right here. I'm going to pull it out. It's called The Minor Pleasures of Life. And it is uh, an anthology by Rose McCauley. It's out of print, but you can buy a copy for $5, you know, online, anywhere. And it's just her selecting excerpts from writers of the 16 and 1700s about just ordinary things that people like. Like, um, (laughs) there's one about getting new clothes. There's, there's one about, uh, how fun it is to give people advice. Um, (laughs) There's things about how uh, how and how nice it is if you're a guy to have a wife that is charmingly busy, <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, and there are all these headers like you know here's a bunch of excerpts about uh, pet animals and skepticism and showing off and hot baths. And it's, it's just a very human book because, you know, a lot of these things were written hundreds of years ago and you feel the same way. Hmm. They, they, they're, they're very human, human emotions as well. So that's The Minor Pleasures of Life by Rose McCauley. And, yes. uh, and I'll put the link there on the show notes. And what would the album be? Uh, I feel like uh, an album that I never, ever get tired of listening to is... Um, is Paul Simon's One Trick Pony, mm-hmm. which I think is not perhaps his best known or even best critically received album, but it's very melancholy and uh, it's a it's a good album to listen to where you would like to feel sad, but you don't actually want anything in your life to make you feel sad. Great. We'll, we'll put that on the show notes as well. So, Erin, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So all you have are the tools of your trade and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but no one knows who you are. You have no contacts. How would you restart? I, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm thinking about this. I think that it's at the same time easier in one way and harder in another way to get started now because of social media. Like it has a great leveling effect, but because there are so many voices, you have to make yours 
uh, unique in some way. Um, and, but I do think that people always like to hear about themselves. So if I were trying to start a new dictionary from scratch tomorrow, I would look for interesting words used by authors who are very active on Twitter and Facebook. And I would say, hey, we included your sentence as an example for our word in our new dictionary. That's smart. And then to use their reach to be able to promote that book. Yes. Or that online resource, not necessarily a physical book. One thing I'm hoping to do with WordNick at some point is to let authors nominate their own sentences because everybody's got a favorite darling sentence that they just wish somebody would say, oh, that sentence, that was the best. Sometimes when you see on Goodreads, like where people pull out sentences from yeah. books that they particularly admired, I feel like every author must go and haunt that page <laughs> to see if their darling, if their darling shows up. Well, Erin, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. I wish you all the best with uh, Wordnik and the other projects that you have going on. What's the best way for people to connect with you and learn more about what you're up to? Oh, um, I am very findable on the internet. I apologize to all the other Erin McKeans who I have shoved off. Um, but uh, I'm just E. McKean on Twitter. And you can find my email address really easily at erinmckean.com. Well, that's great. And we'll put all these on the show notes. Um, Erin, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking to you today and learning about the the power of words and the, the pleasure of words as well. Um, look forward to seeing you and hopefully meeting you in person sometime. Oh, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.